This morning, I would like to examine with you from the Bible the topic of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, specifically looking at the word Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are wanting to study what it means to say that Jesus Christ is the Lord. It means that He is the one who controls all things. It also has to do with Him being crowned with glory and honor. And the third point is that therefore commands my allegiance to Him. So I hope when we finish this study this morning that we'll have a better appreciation of why it is that Jesus Christ is called Lord. We need to understand the significance of that fact about Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And let's read verses 26 through 28. John 20, beginning in verse 26. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Now you will remember that one other time the Lord had appeared to the apostles, after his resurrection, of course, and that's when this is taking place. But Thomas was not there. And when the other apostles had told him they had seen the Lord, he fundamentally said, unless I have hard evidence of that fact, I'm not going to believe. The evidence he required was to actually see the nail prints in the Lord's hands and his feet and the spear wound in his side. Thus, Jesus told him to thrust his hand into his side, to behold the prints in his hands and his feet. The impact of this evidence upon Thomas was the exclamation that he made, My Lord and my God. This ties in with what we want to see this morning. What did he mean when he said, after seeing the evidence of the Lord's resurrection, knowing that the body that died on the cross and went into the tomb was the one that had come out of the tomb, what did he mean when he said, My Lord? It's not just an explanation like some people say today when they see something, which in itself is a form of the vain usage of the Lord's name. This is actually in a day and age when people knew what it meant to call another their Lord. So as we look at this week after the resurrection, as we see Thomas's response to adequate evidence that Christ had risen from the dead, and I might pause here and say, if you don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, then you must say that John the Apostle who recorded this event, who recorded the words of Jesus, who recorded the words of Thomas, was just absolutely wrong. That event didn't take place. Or somebody absolutely lied. He said that's 2,000 years ago. People are giving testimony about the bomber in Boston from last Monday. True testimony. If evidence is going to be offered, what evidence really means? 
that evidence that they're going to use and the testimony to be given will not change, even if it's 2,000 years from now. Now that means you've got to say, I don't believe what this said, and I'm going to go into eternity. I'm going to go to my death saying this is just not right. You wouldn't do that. If he didn't state the truth, and this is not a record of what really happened, what are you going to do about this? Oh, I don't believe it. Why? I won't accept it. Why? It finally comes down to this. I don't want to. And when you don't want to do anything, there's not much anybody can do to help you. Because if you don't want to do something, and you're determined not to want to do it, no amount of explanation is going to help anybody. And that must be kept in mind. But notice the impact it had upon Thomas. My Lord and my God. Tell me why that should not have the same impact upon me. Oh, but it's a lie. You don't know that happened. Well, let's see. How am I going to prove that it didn't happen? Especially with all the other evidence in the scriptures that even secular historians say is a book of antiquity. They don't deny that. Thus, it's recording what did happen. I'm going to say, well, that's not right. That's not true. That didn't happen. Somebody misrepresented the case. Okay? Show me how you know that. You can't just say that. Hey, I'll show you why. If I tell a group of people you're standing here, and I tell a group of people that man's an idiot, he's a thief, and he's a charlatan, how would you feel about that? Would you not say, well, I'll accept the charges if you can prove it adequately? That's why we have courts. That's why we have a justice system. So Jesus is Lord. Why? Because of the evidence. The word Lord comes from the Greek word kuios. And it means the one to whom a person or thing has supremacy or belongs. That's what uh, actually Thomas is saying. And if we refer to Christ as Lord, we ought to be meaning the same thing. It's the one who has the power of deciding what to do with a thing or person. I think people should realize that because Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is someday going to decide what our situation is. And he'll do it on adequate evidence. The Lord is the one who has control, control of a thing. The word Lord is a title of reverence, and it's given to superiors. It was in that day and time the title that slaves used for their masters. The word Lord then conveys all of these meanings. And when used appropriately, then that's what the person means when they use it. I don't know whether you noticed that because you had no reason to specifically focus on the usage of that word in the uh, reading from the Bible. But I had this in mind, so I noticed what was, what was read. And if you notice, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. In other words, if you are a slave who's a Christian, here's your viewpoint of your master. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Now there's the disposition that God said a slave in the first century ought to have toward his master. 
that ought to raise some eyebrows about a lot of things concerning such situations that goes right contrary to what a lot of folks have taught over the years. Then notice in verse 7, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Then he addresses the slave owner, and ye masters do the same things unto them, the slaves, forbearing, threatening. Now watch. Knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I suggest that if we study this morning, you think about what the Bible says about Jesus Christ being Lord and all that the word Lord means, that when you're reading through your Bible, notice the usage of the frequency of the usage of the word Lord, and then think about what it means. Who is in control of all things? Well, the Lord is. Consider what is said by Paul in Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. The scripture reads, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. That helps us better understand when we say Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Or we refer to Christ as the Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly what we are attributing to him and the relationship we have to him. There's no one who is not under his present control, ultimately and finally. Paul wrote in Colossians 1, verses 16 through 19, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Thus to him all must bow, and every tongue will confess his Lordship. When the Lord returns, there's not a person that's ever lived accountable to the Lord for his actions that will not ascribe unto Jesus Christ His Lordship. In Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, Paul wrote, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Him, and given Him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's the way it should be now when people hear the gospel and recognize the truth and the need of Christ and the forgiveness of sins. But if you don't now, when it's too late to be saved, Every atheist and every infidel will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord at the end of the world. 
Everything belongs to Christ. He is Lord. This means that He has the sovereign right to command our actions. Now it said in the scriptures that He was crowned with glory and honor. And it was God the Father who crowned Him with such glory and honor. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, mentioned this, and I want to focus specifically in on verse 7. There the scripture says in Hebrews 2, 7, Thou madest Him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest Him with glory and honor, and didst set Him over the works of Thy hands. But we behold Him who hath been made a little lower than the angels, even Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. But then Peter wrote on this line too, in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18. He says to those Christians, for we did not follow some cunningly devised fable, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there was born such a voice to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice we ourselves heard born out of heaven when we were with him in the holy mount. Let me pause here and say this. Did this man, in writing this part of what we know as part of the New Testament, did he outright lie? Oh, but that was 2,000 years ago. So, what does that have to do with whether something is truth or not truth? Here again is one passage that if Peter told the truth, what does that say concerning your attitude and disposition toward God's Word and toward Jesus Christ? Well, I just don't accept it. Well, why? Well, I don't believe it. Why? And you're forced to answer. And somebody might say, well, I don't have to answer to you. No, you don't have to answer to me, not to me. It is the Lord's right to do what he does because he is Lord. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's rather a ridiculous, absurd statement if Jesus Christ is not who he claimed to be. But if this statement is properly applied to Jesus Christ, what does that say about you? Shouldn't you be in such a relationship that you can make this statement, make it honestly and with all conviction? In the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, John writes, and I saw and I heard. Well, he did or he didn't. He told the truth or he didn't. The divine volume says of John, And I saw and I heard. I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Just a, a host you couldn't count. Saying with a great voice, Worthy is the Lamb that hath been slain to receive the power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things are in them, heard I say unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb be the blessing and the honor 
and the glory and the dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshipped him. Now that's just a stupid record if what is in it is not stating the truth as to the whole of the universe and the invisible eternal world doesn't bow in humble submission and adoration to Jesus Christ. And if you haven't bowed to his gospel to be saved by him, the only Savior, why? All glory and honor belongs to Jesus because he is Lord. This means that our lives must seek to honor and glorify Him in the only way a life can. And that is in submission and obedience to His will. I have to ask the question then, who commands my allegiance? Jesus not only has right to command, but to expect obedience. Remember Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9? Says it is said of Christ and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now you're very familiar with Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came to them, the apostles, and spake unto them, saying, all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Now why would he make that statement? Because he's about to command them to do something. And he must give them the understanding that I am the one in the position to so give this commandment. And he says, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even in the end of the world. Jesus then, when we say he is Lord and truly mean it, is our master. We are his slaves by our own choice because without being, as it were, shackled to him, there is no salvation. We're all quickly rushing toward an eternity. To where this life of the flesh will pale into insignificance. It'll be like a flash of light. And it's gone. Right now it seems this is just the way it always will be and it just goes on. But it won't be. I'm convinced thoroughly. Because I know what the Bible means by time and space. And to a certain extent, what is meant by eternity. That when we reach the eternal stage of our existence, to look back on this little brief thing called time and space, and in the flesh, on the war earth, it just will be like a blink of the eye. Yet we live as if this is the way it's always going to be. Our plans, our aspirations, our education, everything. And yet it's quickly rushing by. To be gone at any moment. And will be at some point. Thus James talks about life of the flesh as a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. The implications of which is you don't put much stock in a vapor. <laughs> he is our Lord. He is our Master. Jesus said in John 13, 13, Ye call me Master and Lord. And then listen to what he said. And ye say, well, for so I am. Christ can't deny himself. He can't deny what he is. Any more than we can deny what we are. We're finite creatures. We're fallible creatures. We're in need of salvation. And we're quickly moving toward our long home to use the terms the prophets had for eternity. He's the only master, the only Lord. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Matthew 23 in verse 10. So Jesus is our one and only master. Jesus is Lord. Now the next time you use that, 
you think about what you're implying concerning Jesus Christ. And think about what that means about your relationship with Him and your approach to Him. Do we live like Jesus our Lord, who said His whole sum and substance was to do the Father's will? Now that related to what had to be done by God to save us that we couldn't do for ourselves. But we being saved by Him through belief and obedience to the gospel, God's power to save us, Romans 1.16, then we are saying He is Lord. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by Him, John 14, 6. That our love for Him always leads us to be obedient to His every commandment. That we seek to bring every thought into subjection to He who is Lord, the Christ. We seek to do only what He has authorized us to do, Colossians three seventeen. Because that's the only way we have of showing Him we love Him and we have faith in God and the Christ and the system of salvation that's recorded infallibly in the Bible. One day, He will be our judge because He is Lord. John 12 and verse 48. Thus, what does that imply to us? I said in the beginning of this sermon, if you're outside of Christ, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, then you're in a state of being lost because you're still standing guilty of your sins before God. And sin's the only thing that can send you to torment. Somebody may not like you. Your boss may not really like you, but puts up with you because you do the job. Your wife may not like you that much. The husband may just kind of put up with you because you're in a wedding or a relationship, a marriage. It says, here I am. And that's the way it's going to be. Kids may not care a thing in the world about you. But how does that justify you violating the Lord, the only one that can save your soul when his whole life is over? One time in closing, I'll, I'll relate this. This was probably 35 years ago, maybe longer. There was a couple in a congregation where I was laboring in Arkansas. And it was one of these situations to where they were older than my parents at that time, to where they constantly caused problems. It didn't make any difference what the elders did or whatever else. That was about the time that Vietnam fell, and we worked at Fort Chaffee, one of three places where the Vietnamese came in as they got them out of Vietnam when it fell. So we worked out there from about this time of year till September, going almost every day to teach classes and, and so on. To show you how this couple was, uh, born in the kickative mood, an objective case, and everything had to be to suit them, I made a report at the end as to what the congregation had been involved in, in my work and so forth. And they found fault with that because I was blowing my own horn. At least that's the way they viewed it. I, such as that I've been exposed to all my preaching career, so it's nothing new. You know, when you go to a congregation, it's the same thing, just different faces. You can't be different than what you are, folks. And human nature is the same whether it's here or 50 years ago or 1,000 years ago or whether it's in Arkansas. You're either going to fit the pattern of truth that says the Lord is the Lord and I'll be as He wants me to be, or you won't. And so these were upset about something the elders did and another man who was a very devout member of the congregation. And we had a meeting. And uh, they began to talk about something or another. I don't know what they were talking about. But it involved me. So I said, wait a minute, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, they seemed rather surprised because they'd already assumed that the elders knew what I did. That's a bad assumption, folks. So finally the woman looked at me and she said, well, if you've got your bosses on your side and they're happy with you, you ought to be happy. Bosses. You know who she's talking about? Talking about the elders. That one word coming from her, because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, told me 
a lot of things about our viewpoint of the church and how things are determined and what goes on. Brethren, I became a Christian, and so did you if you really became one, because I obeyed Jesus Christ because He's Lord. And do you know what? The elders, the responsibility they have, the authority they have, that's delegated by Jesus who has all authority, I obey them because they're in the divine pattern of the authoritative will of Christ. I preach the qualifications of deacons and elders and the work of deacons and elders and the work of every member of the church and the importance of submitting to the commandments, the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ because that's the right thing to do is the Bible defines the right. You know, I, I don't obey these elders because they're my bosses. And you shouldn't either. You obey them because of the authority Jesus gave them when they're qualified to be what they are. And when we preach the work, qualifications, and work of deacons, we abide by that and we have elders and deacons because Jesus Christ is Lord. The worship on the first day of the week, where do we get the idea for that? In the Lord's last will and testament where he presents his authority. The five acts of worship in which we engage in this worship on the first day of the week. Why do we do that? Why do we contend for it? To make my bosses happy? Absolutely not. The ultimate and the final reason is because Jesus Christ is preeminent and Lord of Lords. Why do we do anything we do? In becoming a Christian and living the Christian life. Because Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that better be the way it is in everything you think, say, and do all day long, every day in your life. As a man... Do you act as the Bible says a man ought to act because Jesus is Lord? And just say as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, as a neighbor, as a citizen, while well, the Lord's addressed every bit of how you're to act in each one of those roles. And even tells us how to deal with those who are enemies. Even tells us how to be angry and sin not. Thus we labor to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. Years and years ago, when I spoke as a young man to quite a few youth gatherings back in the 60s, some in the 70s, I would emphasize to young people the truth, so I can still emphasize now that I'm not a young people, <laughs> that the greatest challenge you will ever face all through your life is the challenge to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. Anybody that tells me there's no challenge to being a Christian, and that means of Christ, don't, they just don't know what they're talking about. I had my sins, my alien sins, the sins that originally separated me from God, all washed away on a Wednesday night, May 27th, 1959. It's when I was baptized for the remission of my sins. Camden, Arkansas, the Cullendale Church of Christ. Now that put me on a course. The Lord had me to the church that night, Acts 2.47. And that gave me a state of favor with God in the family of God, the church, the kingdom of God. And thus I began a course of trying to bring my life into subjection to Jesus Christ. And it's continued all these years. And if I'm faithful unto death, that means it will continue to the day I die. Of course, sometimes we're not even in profession, possession of our faculties when we die. But that's the course one lives on, and you're promised of God that you can get the job done. I will be with you. You just be determined to do all that's authorized. And that involves loving our brethren. Why in the world should I love some of you, if any of you? Will you tell me that? 
Why? Some of you are the most obnoxious humans there was on the face of the earth when you want to be. Now, you know, I can stand up before any congregation, any size, anywhere in the world, and make that statement. And you know, the Lord knows that's true. Because the Lord knows your heart even as you think and your motives are right now. <laughs> he knows it's true. But you see, that's the same thing concerning me at times. Are you everything that the Bible says you ought to be every split second of every day? Let me see the hands of all those who are willing to say every split second of every day, I have my mind right where the Bible says it ought to be. Why, you won't raise your hand. If you did, I'd say you're proving right now that you're not. Well, then what keeps us on God's side? What helps us say Jesus is Lord? What helps us be all the New Testament says we ought to do? It's because the whole system of salvation allows for all of that. But it means I have the total determination to be in submission to He who is Kurios, Lord, in control of all things, who sits at the right hand of the Almighty and who rules over all things, because I am going to come before His throne, and I'm going to give an account of what I've done in this life, whether good or bad. And I better be faithful to Him that the blood will cover me, that I'll stand before Him faultless. So I can hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. So you go home today or wherever you're going and you say, yes, the Bible's right. Jesus is Lord. And know that that means what it means. And then say, I will align my life where it ought to be. One thing that it does mean, among many things, is that I can know when I'm not living the kind of life the Lord said because I know His Word, I know His will, and I compare and contrast my life with it. Well, today, let me ask you this. Have you believed from the heart on the basis of the Scriptures that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God? Have you, if you've done that, fully, completely repented of all your sins? Are you willing, or have you already, Confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Have you already been obedient completely to the Christ of becoming a Christian by being baptized by the authority of He who is Lord for the remission of your sins? Now, if you haven't done any of those or left any one of them undone, you stand before God guilty, and that Lord will come and condemn you someday because you deserve it. You deserve it. He will judge you on the basis of the evidence and the light of the divine standard that is His infallible will. On the other hand, if you've obeyed the gospel and you're faithful to Him, you'll be saved. As a Christian, though you may have from the heart obeyed the gospel, have you wandered away from Him? You're not so Christian right now in your life because of a sin of sins. Will you humbly repent and submit to the Lord in confessing those sins and praying for forgiveness? If we're unwilling to submit to Him to gain remission of sins, then why would we expect Him to be willing to say, you're all right, go on to heaven anyway. When everything the Bible says, He's not going to do that. He is Lord. Will you acknowledge Him as Lord and become a Christian today before you leave this building? Before you have to stand before Him judgment, and hear the Lord condemn you for your lack of love and obedience to Him. If you're subject to the Lord's wonderful invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.